Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, this is Susan Babai. Uh, I would like to speak a little bit today and in this episode about Persian painting in relation to the question of uh, representations of human figure and especially in relation to the question of Islamic arts. A word about Islamic arts is really uh, um, paramount at the beginning. Uh, the term has been formed, the application of it has been promoted by collectors and um, curators, if you will, connoisseurs in the late 19th century, early 20th century, as part of categorizing a body of work which was being collected quite avidly as museums were being produced or, or put together actually. Uh, and indeed works uh, of the kind that those collectors, connoisseurs and curators and museums, early museums thought to belong to one cohesive category of arts was put together under the rubric of Islamic arts. It's not about Islam. In other words, it's not the same as Christian arts or Buddhist arts in the sense that we all understand that uh, the arts in the Islamic context uh, and especially figural representation narratives are not there to teach the faith. Uh, rather in Islam, the dependence in terms of teaching the faith is entirely on the writing. So the word and the script, hence this incredible development of the art of writing and the arts of the book across the Islamic world throughout its history. So when we use the term Islamic, we don't mean it. And it's not about Islamic as a faith, but rather as a category of the arts. And this was a construct of 19th century, 20th century uh, European and American collectors, connoisseurs. And um, uh, though it is not adequate uh, and indeed oftentimes problematic, uh, we uh, have no better substitute for it as yet. Uh, the only option is to go down the road of what European arts have been categorized, which is on the nation state basis of making things, for instance, Italian arts or French arts. So on that basis, some have argued Persian arts or Arab arts. And what is our Arab arts? Uh, it's, it's very complicated. Um, I actually would like to start by this notion of Persian arts because the problematic comes out of the fact that these categories of nation state or borders as we understand it uh, are modern constructs in fact, even though we know that there is a, a very ancient presence of the Achaemenids across a vast region of the world and this is understood as the Persian Empire, it is not continuously a matter of borders being recognized as such. So for instance, in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, there are a number of different dynasties that rule over different parts of the Iranian expanse. So that greater Iran, the plateau. And, um, and so you cannot quite speak of Persian arts as if it is one, uh, cohesive, uh, um, essentialized category either. So I want to begin uh, with this uh, bag. This is known famously as the Courtauld bag. I teach at the Courtauld Institute and I've worked a lot with this bag as this is one of those great teaching objects of our Courtauld gallery. Uh, the Courtauld bag was actually made in Mosul in Northern Iraq. Uh, by craftsmen who were experts in metalworking and especially inlay metalworking uh, with silver, gold, 
they would add these color effects, these chromatic effects onto the surface of the, uh, of the uh, 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 metal object, the metal sheets, which were hammered and shaped into a bag. Uh, that the um, motifs, the sort of background of these beautifully uh, squiggly shapes of the uh, of the uh, uh, textile like that we see in the background and these cartouches, the roundels, the figural pieces, uh, musicians and uh, and hunts hunters and uh, courtiers and so forth uh, are actually quite standard in the metalwork in Mosul uh, in the 13th century, but also we find them in metalwork made in uh, in Herat, in Greater Khorasan, uh, around the same time. Uh, this bag actually belongs to the period after the Mongol invasions, uh, after they settle, in fact, in West Asia, that is covering really Iran and Iraq of today, as well as parts of uh, Eastern Anatolia, the Caucasus, and indeed they extend the empire of the Mongols goes from China all the way to this West Asian borders and indeed goes into Central Asia and White Russia as well. So a great Mongol state is formed under which several independent and, and uh, 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 really uh, uh, culturally distinct groups exist. Amongst them uh, are the Ilkhanids. Uh, the bag was produced, in other words, in a very highly regarded uh, city where such objects were made in Mosul in northern Iraq. Uh, but on top of its, uh, uh, the top of the lid uh, on this area, there is a band of uh, an image that shows us a scene of revelry uh, which does not really belong to the kinds of skills and image making uh, categories that we attribute to Mosul. The bag is actually also very much related to a courtly environment. Uh, we understand it to be in fact related to perhaps a khatun, a woman of high rank of the Ilkhanid court and here I show you a painting of a later date. So the bag was made circa 1300, but I show you a bag here uh, depicted, looks like it is a metal bag and held by an attendant of this young princess in a scene, outdoor scene of reception from the Divan of Khaju Kermani, uh, which was made in Baghdad uh, during the Jaloyerid period, so later in the 14th century. So we know this was a highly sophisticated object of ceremonial function. It belonged to a woman of the high ranks in the Ilkhanid court. But how do we know how it fits into this bigger picture? I want to look at this in terms of also whether representations of figural uh, scenes of these wonderfully narrative uh, subjects, such as that scene of the reception outdoors or those figures on, this, on the bag, in fact, are legitimate in the context of Islamic arts. So it goes back to that question of what is Islamic actually, which is not about a religious position in regards to the arts. Rather, we should ask the question in terms of, it depends really, which cultural setting, which period actually under whose, whose patronage and what are the sort of social and, and political and cultural conditions within which the work is, uh, is produced. We do have, in fact, a sense of the secular and the sacred, although it is artificially uh, created as a dichotomy, it is true and always the case that in the Islamic world, throughout its history, it's an incredibly rare thing 
if you find figural representations in mosques or madrasas, in places of religious function, essentially. This is unlike Christianity, where churches are covered with uh, figural representations of narratives that are used to teach the public, the viewers, the, the worshipers about the faith, about Christianity, essentially. That's not how Islam is taught, and that's not how its, its teachings are disseminated. It goes through the means of the word, essentially. Uh, we follow uh, in, in uh, historical thinking about art, a kind of a Hegelian systematization of the visual arts, where, for instance, categories such as architecture always have a place of their own, but European arts uh, consider sculpture, painting, and then decorative arts, and decorative arts being things that you use, uh, utilitarian objects. It actually is pejorative in the sense that it sounds as if all these things, which are not panel paintings and sculpture, are in fact frivolous. They have no function. That is a, a major problematic of studying art through an art historical framing that was made for European arts. And even in European arts, we no longer think about decorative arts as being frivolous, decorative in other words, or ornamental. So how these kinds of categorizations fit with the visual and material cultures of Islam are really crucial. So we understand that epigraphy or calligraphy, the art of beautiful writing, to have a very high status, and that is directly related to the primacy of the Holy Quran, the fact that it was copied and distributed and that it is an important document, uh, the reference point for Muslims across the globe throughout its history. One of the points about this is that what we understand from the, uh, the, uh, the Quran, from the uh, Quranic points of view, that uh, making a painting is not uh, forbi forbidden, uh, but rather making things that can act like uh, idols is, are forbidden. So in other words, the prohibition is against idol worship. And because at the time of the emergence of Islam and the life of the Prophet Muhammad, the Christian world was uh, completely enwrapped in the production of icons and, and the, even the, uh, the period of iconoclasm in the Byzantine world coincides with this period of emergence of Islam in the sense that the, the sort of uh, the closeness uh, of some of these icons as items of worship, but becoming really like a uh, like uh, 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 beyond, for instance, aid for worship, had made um, Christian communities also very nervous. But the point I'm trying to make is that that's not the prohibition that is we assume coming from the Quran or from the teachings of Islam. Quite the contrary, uh, that, uh, and that's an important point, that as long as it doesn't become a, an idol or an object of worship, uh, it's not really, strictly speaking, forbidden. There are a number of hadith that speak to that. In any case, uh, what is so important about uh, understanding the link between the high point or high regard for calligraphy and writing and its reverberations as we see through the history of Islam in different parts of the Islamic world is that the qalam, the reed pen with which uh, the writing is done, in fact, is or, or which was meant to be uh, the tool for writing the, the word of God becomes in fact a tool as well in the later period and in particular in the period 
uh, around uh, the uh, 15th, 16th centuries in the Iranian world or Persianate world where Persian language becomes language of high culture as one that is highly regarded, that it is capable of endowing the same kinds of values, the same kinds of uh, high cultural uh, regard that the reed pen has for the artist's brush, actually. So there is something about this idea of the theory of the two qalams, which means there are the qalam, the reed pen, and then the brush, which is elevated in the primarily in the 16th century uh, in the writings of various uh, historians and what might be called early art historians like Qazi Ahmad Qomi, who writes Gulistan Honar, or Abul Fazl, who is the historian of Emperor Akbar of Mughal India, who writes Aina Akbari, that this elevation of the artist comes with it. Pen, the reed pen and the writing of the, of the word of God, the Quranic passages, and indeed the writing and copying of, cop, uh, of handmade, uh, luxuriously decorated Qurans continue to be very important in the context of the Islamic artistic production. But it also lend, lends, the, the Quranic production lends value and high regard for the culture of books and the arts of the book, essentially. So what we find is a, a no, an enormous investment in making books in the Islamic world. So from early period, and especially in, in the center of the Abbasid empire in Baghdad, uh, where a lot of different people from all over the uh, Islamic lands have converged and are active there. There are um, North Africans as much as Central Asians, as much as Iranians, Khorasani people and so forth, that this energy comes together in the making of books is hugely important. We know, for instance, libraries, major libraries, the painting on the left, which is from a, a copy of the Maqamat, which was made in Baghdad just before the uh, the, uh, the sack of Baghdad by the Mongols shows us stacks of books in this library behind uh, this group of uh, uh, learned uh, men gathered around. Bookmaking, in other words, is not just about the Quran, but also about making books of various topics, scientific ones, the adab literature, and indeed classical texts, which are both in Arabic as in Maqamat and in Persian, as we find Shahnameh's Hamsa's Divan, Divan of Hafiz and, and uh, Jami and, and so on and so forth. So massive, explosive production of the arts and continuous across the Islamic world. What is so interesting about all of this is that when the Mongols attack the center of Abbasids in Baghdad and really cut off uh, the, the eastern and par western parts of the Islamic world uh, and indeed destroy that notion of caliphate as it was known, uh, that gives an opportunity perhaps or opens up a space for the Ilkhans, for these um, uh, ethnically Mongol overlords of greater Iran to develop a new um, set of ideas around bookmaking. And that's when we see the Persian language becomes the lingua franca gradually, that it becomes <clears throat> the language of high culture. It's really thanks to the Mongols whom we think of as the scourge of the earth and the destroyer of everything. But in fact, they preserved major skill sets, important uh, uh, sort of resources. And uh, there is a major flourishing of the arts after the Mongols under the, uh, pr uh, under the rule of the Ilkhanids and book arts in the Persian speaking world gain uh, major ascendancy. 
But what is so important about all of this is to know that painting, figural representation, calligraphy, or writing, all of these are parts of a collective um, uh, idea, a posture that is differently exercised in different parts of the Islamic world, but that they are all part of uh, understanding how objects are transformed. So for instance, the Courtauld bag that sh I showed earlier shares a great deal with something like this brass bowl in which inlay with silver has been used to transform the surface of a base metal brass. And here with the, uh, the engraved and inlaid um, uh, calligraphic bands, the Quranic uh, um, uh, references and the decoration, the object is transformed from just being a simple bowl to something that has artistic value. And that is across the entire region what we call the Islamic world. This is not decorative in a frivolous sense, but in fact, lending value, lending high quality, wondrous quality to objects of every, everyday use. That's significant. This, this is the way we need to look at what we call Islamic arts, however you might think about it, to think about the shared concepts here I show you, for instance, the fantastic mihrab of Al Jaitu, the Ilhan, in the Great Mosque of Esfahan, Masjid Jum'a of Esfahan, which is dated to just a little bit later than, for instance, our court old bag or this Mosul basin that I show you on the right hand side. Mosul basil, basin is for a different context of use as against, for instance, the carved. Uh, molded stucco of the mihrab of the mosque, but they share notions of that richness of patterns, the transformation of base metal into something quite wondrous. And what that does in terms of uh, contemplation, in terms of uh, visual sort of elevation of, of one's uh, soul, one's uh, capacity to imagine uh, the grandeur of the created world through these abstracted, densely patterned uh, motifs that cover surfaces of so many different things is part of thinking about not decorative art and not just calligraphy, but this uh, sort of uh, incredibly significant understanding in the Islamic context of, of the text, it could be um, Quranic or it could be just a signature or something informative, but that ennobles the object. And it does not necessarily exclude the figural material. That is uh, one of the points I, I wanted to make is to really think about what is Islamic in Islamic arts and, and think in terms of the motifs, the particular sort of um, foci, foci, the way in which ornament or these uh, forms, architectural, natural, zoomorphic, figural, they all acquire social meaning. It's my job, it's our job to understand through their materials, through their, their making actually, the craftsmanship, through their functions, the meanings that they carry. They are not the stories of the Bible, but they are indeed very deeply embedded in the cultural worlds of their own time and place. And it's our job to figure those out rather than dismiss them as objects of decorative value or utilitarian, therefore not art. This is art, ornament and transformation of the surfaces is art and that's the important part for us. And it's across the Islamic world. I just wanted to show examples of the way in which we understand this in the early periods, for instance, in Spain, in this fantastic Umayyad 
um, this is from the um, from southern Spain, the Andalusia, this pixis of Almogira, and also these monochromatic luster painted ceramics like the one from Fatimid Egypt. In all of these, note that the figural representation is abstracted actually. That's where the actual portrait like or a sort of mimetic approach, the kind of approach that makes them look like they are real people is very pointedly avoided in order not to reach the moment of wonderment, wonderment and uh, looking at, at images of figures, of recognizable figures as if they stand for the divine. That's unacceptable in Islam. The divine God is transcendent and utterly transcendent. And hence, you do not have any zoomorphic or anthropomorphic representations of God, the divine, rather the natural world, the created world, and the world of, I world of ideas stand for the enormity of that capacity. This is part of the subject of Islamic arts and storytelling and bringing the word now in a different context, not the Quranic context, but like the Fatimid object or the uh, Andalusian uh, carved uh, ivory pixies. Other ones also are about telling stories that have moralizing uh, aims or are um, uh, in fact uh, historically important or reference certain uh, uh, symbolic values and so forth. And these become subjects of painters. In a, and, and by painters, I mean more than those who work with the brush, like the Shahnama page on the right, but also the ones who work on ceramics. Many of these are in fact, like the ones on the left-hand side from the Minai ware uh, of pre-Mongol mostly period, uh, where elements of storytelling are there, but without the text. It is when we begin to see the two coming together that the storytelling and the text itself together with these pages that are painted with aspects of the text, such as we see Bahram e Gura and Azadeh's story that was in the earlier 12th century Menai ceramic bowl, uh, now part of a whole text of, of, uh, of the manuscript being represented in episodes such as the one you see on the right hand side. That these are connected to a historical understanding, even going back perhaps to notions of, for instance, uh, representations of kingship. <coughs> a king on horseback hunting, as we know it from various uh, objects and uh, rock reliefs of the Sasanian period that inspire perhaps er early examples in the Islamic context of um, metal workers and uh, glass makers. I show you uh, one on the right, which is uh, from Mamluk, Syria potentially, but that it shows these uh, uh, men on horseback running around the, the body of the object, this enameled glass, like, uh, like a, um, a hunt scene. Uh, or the courtauld bag with these uh, roundels where the hunting as one of those elements of high sort of social elite activity, kingly activity, gives the object that kind of a meaning, makes it uh, legible to a cultural context, in fact. And then, <clears throat> and here is what I wanted to point to, figural representation, on, for instance, the lid of the courtauld bag is not something that is the norm in making the metalwork of the medieval period, uh, like those Mosul objects or the uh, 
the kind that we might even see in, in glass pieces or ceramic bowls or so. This, this lid, in fact, has its origins most likely on paper. It's very clearly connected to a particular visualization of a narrative as it is on, uh, told onto, uh, through a bunch of sort of figural compositions. It's a scene of, of a reception, a drinking party, if you will, with a woman, the Khatun perhaps, uh, for whom this bag was made, seated here. She has lost a lot of the enamel, or not the enamel, excuse me, the, the, uh, silver, uh, the silver inlay. Therefore, you can't quite see her, but she's seated on a bench and uh, has an attendant uh, on this side. And then two rows of attendants, those on, on the left-hand side who are sort of preparing drinks or Chinese tables even there, or have the bird of prey ready here. The ones on the right hand side um, include an attendant who is holding a mirror for her. Interestingly, the mirror is inlaid as well so that you can see the reflection of her onto the mirror. He as well carries a bag over his shoulder, which is like this bag in fact. And then others uh, behind him who sort of are accompanying her in this scene. Most likely such a piece was drawn, composed, conceptualized in one of the Kitab Khane or the Kitab Khane in Tabriz, which Ilhani set up. In another episode, I spoke about the Kitab Khane that um, uh, uh, Rab -e Rashidiva and, and the really important presence of, um, of the great vizier of Ghazan Khan and Ol Jaitu had set up. And, and that's the kind of source of information we assume for the Courtauld bag's top design, that, that lid design. In other words, everything else around the Courtauld bag was part of the repertoire of the inlaid masterworks of those who worked in Mosul. But the commission came out of Tabriz most likely for a khatun and came with a, a, a design in this elongated horizontal composition for the lid of that bag. And we know the bag had a function within a courtly context of the Ilhanids. We know that it belonged to a woman. I show you again this painting from Divan of Khadru Kermani, where an assistant is holding a bag that looks like a metal bag, like a, a gold piece. The Courtauld bag is unique, it, that we don't have any other examples of it surviving. So it really says <clears throat> a whole lot about <clears throat> the cultural setting here. And down below, I show you one of those amazing drawings which come out of Tabriz of early 14th century. And that shows another image of a khatun with attendants and someone who is walking ahead like a, um, a, a major sort of a, a ceremonial uh, entry point. And one of these attendants also is wearing over her shoulder in this case, a bag similar to the Courtauld bag. So my point is that while we might call it Iranian or Iraqi, in both cases, we are wrong. This is an, a work of the Ilhani period. It is a 14th century, sort of a grander, larger environment of uh, greater Iran, or as it was known in Persian, texts and historical writing as Iraqain, the two Iraqs, which would bring the western part of Iran and the eastern or an Iraq of today together. Or in fact, we can talk about these things, not in terms of pure Persian or Iranian or purely Iraqi, uh, as neither of these existed as countries as we know them, but rather as products of culturally complex, multifaceted, multi-confessional, in fact, 
multiracial, multi-ethnic, multilingual environments under the rubric, under the umbrella of the rule of the Ilkhans. In fact, such a condition makes for the best way for us to understand how the Iranian, the Iraqi, or the Persian and the Arab, and the Mongol in this case, the Turco Mongol, all come together in the context of Islamic arts in a, in a moment and at a, at a location such as we know these products come through, like the Courtauld bag, like the paintings and the whole manuscripts, those manuscripts of Rashid al-Din's Jama al Tabarikh, which were illustrated to, re uh, to record both in written words and in uh, paintings, the histories of uh, the Mongols, of Islam, and of Iranian past, all moved into one sort of cohesive present for them. It's also there in Tabriz of, of this period that we find the earliest uh, manuscripts of the Shahnameh that are now illustrated luxurious copies like the great Mongol Shahnameh, which are quite large. They have these magnificent large Baghdadi paper. Baghdad was a center of production of highly regarded paper and paintings that show this multiple sources of information coming together. So what we find in this early period is in fact at the emergence of a new style in painting, which is distinct from what we know in the earlier periods, that is pre-Islamic periods. It really is merging a knowledge of Chinese arts, block prints, uh, methods of, of creating landscape perhaps, with this very uh, distinctive newly sort of composed and conceptualized ways of painting. In the paintings of the Ilkhanid period, we still can see the traces of knowledge of Chinese painting, like these gnarled trees or the way the ground is worked out. All of those begin to disappear in later periods. I want to finish this by going back to this whole idea of figural representation and Islamic arts, the, the banishment of this idea actually, to say this sort of thinking is of a later construction uh, for the Persianate world in fact, and not everywhere is it applied. In other words, it depends. So the Western Islamic world tended towards greater orthodoxy in regards to whether or not figural representations were permissible. In the Eastern parts of the Islamic world, this wasn't the case. And I want to emphasize, this is not just an Iranian invention, nor is it a Shiite preference. Rather, and we know that, for instance, manuscripts such as the one you see here on the left-hand side, which comes from a 14th century uh, date, it's a, it belongs, or 14th, 15th century date, belongs to a period before these divisions between Shi'i and Sunni become really sharpened as they do at the early part of the 16th century. And that you may have, in fact, uh, paintings that show the face of the prophet and, uh, and uh, the first Imam Ali uh, in full, or uh, in fact, um, later on covered and uh, um, present as well. So in the Ottoman world, things de develop differently from uh, what happens in the Iranian world. But in regards to, for instance, the face of the, the holy personages uh, in paintings, and it depends on the place and time. Islam does not, in other words, have a blanket prohibition against the representations of figures. It depends on the context. It depends on the um, uh, place, in fact, and the time period. And we know that there are a large number of 
themes and genres in figural painting and that they operate in different ways in different parts of the Islamic world and at different time periods. But it's not a question of a single approach, nor is it historically viable to claim that Iranians did it and not everyone else. That doesn't work either. So thank you very much. And I hope you have enjoyed this session. <laughs>